Hi, everybody. It's Joe Wessels. Welcome back to From Cincinnati. This is episode two, and uh, today's guest is Heather French Henry, uh, also known as Miss America 2000, and uh, the wife of the former lieutenant governor of the state of Kentucky, Steve Henry. Uh, Heather was also a uh, morning news anchor at the Fox affiliate in Louisville for a while. Um, She also is a big time, very active veterans advocate. Well, just this past fall, uh, she was a candidate for the Kentucky Secretary of State, a race that she uh, she eventually lost, but we talked to her during the campaign. Full disclosure, Heather and I have known each other a very long time. Um, never extremely close, but it's somebody, if, if you've met Heather, you know that just knowing her a little bit, you feel like you know her really well because she's just a very kind-hearted, open person, and um, that's the way she's always been. That's the way I've always known Heather. She's um, she's a good person, and I'm happy to share this conversation with you, so I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Where to start? Oh my gosh, so... You, 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 you from, let's, just, let's start from the beginning. Where, where, the beginning. Where, were you, where, where were you born? <laughs> that, that's a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I'm actually from Augusta in Maysville, Kentucky. Yeah. I was born in Fort Thomas, which of course then oh, had yeah. St. Luke Hospital. And now everything's changing to like St. Elizabeth's. Mm. And you know, you're getting old when the things and the places where you've been start changing names yes, right. or they're just flat out torn down they're gone right and then you're all in your memories or you call it by his old name like right yes i would always say like i grew up i was born at christ hospital but i I would grow up near providence hospital and then for like 15 it's gone they actually torn it down just like see that just ages you right right there and i'd call it providence hospital people say it's called mercy mount airy now or something and i'm like what but it's still providence hospital so then you know you're kind of getting old because but actually, I don't feel old, but I don't know. You know, There are moments, right? So I yeah. took my daughters to University of Cincinnati to kind of see the campus yeah. and to see all the changes. That would be a sign you're getting older, I guess. Yeah, right. When all of that develop. Oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. When you're actually doing those college visits and you go, I can't possibly be old enough to be their mother, certainly. Yeah. But so many great memories, though. You know, I saw Daniels Hall and, mm-hmm. you know, then just seeing all of the new development. I can't believe they took out parking the parking lots in front of Sawyer because that that would have oh, they made yeah. a grassy knoll like oh when it's do much you, nicer yes. when do you ever see that happen usually when something gets black topped it is never jackhammered up to yeah. create nature or to that get was the back cheap parking nature. lot it was like yeah. it was like the blue sea parking lot or something i don't know i, I didn't have a car till i was 22 and a really? senior in college yeah where'd you no, live i live well i lived at daniels and i lived at sawyer and then my senior year because you know at dap yeah. It's a five-year. Our design program's five-year. Okay. And so then my senior year, I got the brilliant idea that I was going to actually move off campus and get an apartment. That's when I got my car. Oh, okay. And then I realized what a stupid idea that was because then I had to, like, drive back onto near campus and find a parking space yeah. when I could have just lived on campus still right. and walked to DAP. Um, but, no, I moved on the other side of DAP down Martin Luther King. So That's funny because well. we had this weird sort of – and then we met – Working at the news record, the news which is the record. School, school paper. Yeah. But I didn't tell you this before we started recording, but we actually knew each other kind of through, because one of my best friends at the time was a guy named Chris Cannenberg. Did oh, you? sure. Oh, my So gosh. I knew you through Chris and that crew. Yeah, absolutely. And and then um, I believe, so my sister dated um, Mike Distel, whose okay. brother Andy was a trumpet player, who I believe <gasps> oh you sang gosh, with. Oh, my gosh, I did. So I feel oh. like I knew you. Like there were all these different ways that people. What? That's right. And well, I, I don't remember. I don't. It's a small community, though. When you think about, it. I mean, Cincinnati is a great metropolitan city. Don't it's like get me wrong. Like the biggest small town in the world. Sure. Well, I don't know. Louisville might take that one, oh, but you is know, that where Cincinnati. You live now, I do live okay. in Louisville now. Um, but Cincinnati is is you know it's a, obviously a little bit bigger, certainly. But I mean, for as many people that are there, and especially with the whole university crowd, I felt like I ran into everybody that I knew all the time. Yeah. Certainly. So I'm not shocked. But I didn't know that we had all those degrees of separation. But Andy yeah. was a trumpet player, right? Yeah, he still is. His, oh, his, yeah. His twin brother, I hate, fortunately, died in a car accident a couple of years ago. And my sister oh. dated him like all through high school. It was devastating to say the least because he was oh, such I'm a good so guy. Sorry. His older brother Matt. I don't know if you know Matt. Is I, is he a DAP grad? But he was a curator at the CAC. Okay. Um, I forget what he's doing now, but he's he's like a big arts guy. So it's kind of just well, and that family so, is amazing. But what's so beautiful about Cincinnati? It's such it has a great, vibrant art community. It does. And Dad, for, especially for me, for a city that size. when I took my daughters up there and I was explaining my undergraduate, my masters, and all that I did up there, that it is one of the most. Uh, 
illustrious, world-renowned design schools, but it's right in our backyard, and most people don't know the reputation that it has. You know, sometimes yeah, right. you're never a prophet in your own backyard, right? So yeah, sure. DAP is a little bit like that. And when I tell people I have a Bachelor of Science in Design, they mm-hmm. go, oh, you mean a Bachelor of the Arts? I went, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. It's a BS in Design in many yeah. different ways, I yeah, guess you'd right. say. <laughs> but the education and work experience I got through DAP, um, one day, one day when I retire from this crazy life I have, I would like to go back and teach at oh, DAP. Oh, no kidding. Oh, well, you yeah. know Margie Volker Ferrier, she was my master's thesis advisor, and she know. just I passed away. Oh, okay. And she was, wow, what a what a wonderful, just substantial person in my life who helped mm-hmm. me out so much. I mean, she'd worked all over the world, wonderful illustrator. Mm-hmm. She gave me the Golden Brush Award in illustration. She's the reason when I came back to graduate school that I actually wound up teaching fashion illustration okay. for two years before then I won Miss Kentucky and then Miss America. But what's really funny about DAP is in the time when I started competing for Miss America, not a lot of people, you knew I was competing and several others, yes. but most of the people... Because as I told you, first, we always try to get you to come out yeah, right. with well, us and, and, and play like high school, was, like college play. I was afraid play. I might be disqualified. For yeah, well, you, we weren't too crazy, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, here's this pretty girl who was so nice. Thank you. You all still are. No, we always were so nice. I was like, the first thing you say about Heather is she's just such a nice person. Ah, thank you. And I talked to people, we should say we're in Bowling Green, Kentucky recording this and I was just working at the Kentucky uh, Sheriff's Association meeting, and folks here just people. I, I, I kind of met a guy from uh, Maysville who uh, Patrick Boggs. Patrick Boggs, the sheriff. Yeah, he's the uh-huh. sheriff. He's the president of the association. And um, I was like, oh well, you I, Heather French. Just I was texting her. I think she's going to be here. Oh, is and they just love, everybody just Aww. so that's it's a very well. Nice. That's a great testament. Thank you. You're welcome. And but we could never get you to come out and play with us. You know, I say play in quotes like college at. You say, I got I got this beauty pageant, or or you. Well, or it's you a said preliminary, preliminary, yes. But mm-hmm. I wouldn't have known what that. But you but, know, the interesting thing about that is, you know, it, it did make me stay sort of on the straight and narrow. So yeah. I made very low risk choices <laughs> um, going through college because I was always afraid I'd get disqualified or something because right. they have such strict rules. But most of the people in DAP did not realize they knew I would go away on the weekends and kind of compete to win something, Uh but I don't think they understood the magnitude of it. So when I finally became Miss Kentucky and then Miss America, I had so many of my friends and even professors that emailed me and they said, I had no idea you could sing. I had no idea you could. And so I I didn't have any idea that you were like on that trajectory. Trajectory, I, if right? I, I sort of leaded. I, I, I like led, leaded. I sort of led two different lives, right? So okay. I had that part of my life that I would leave for a weekend and go back home to Kentucky and I, compete, and then the years I wouldn't win, I would just come back to school. Um, but all of that competition paid for all of my undergraduate masters, amazing, so it paid off yeah. all my student loans. See, and if I really would have known what you were doing, I would have kept my mouth. Just said, "Oh no, she. This is you important. Said, you she don't need to, do need to go. With you us. don't need to come out with us and <laughs> go to Uncle Woody's out. and drink beer or whatever." <laughs> Where was the? Oh well, I can't remember. No. I'm thinking of the restaurant that I remember eating pizza with you, and that was right next to the news record. I oh my goodness, I don't was, even know what it was, was right it? underneath. I just remember going clubbing at our club when I was a freshman. <laughs> yeah, in yeah, I remember that place. on Thursday nights. Thursday nights because I think no cover or something. Like well, that. and you could be um, eighteen. Oh, that was and it, so right. after my birthday on on December 29th of that year, I was seventeen when I got into UC. Wow. So um, when I turned eighteen, I was allowed to go on on Thursday nights. Gotcha. So let's go. Let's go back Maysville. Go back or, even uh, further. Uh, okay. So you, do you, did you ever live in Maysville or do you live in Augusta? Oh, yeah, both. Oh, okay. So I, my great-grandfather, seven generations ago, founded Augusta in nope. 1795. You're kidding me. I didn't so know. my family is entrenched in that area. That was area. another experience. I should stop interrupting you. That's all right. No, go but ahead. I, walk, I once I drove into Augusta a few years ago, and I was like, in my oh, in my, my navigation device, said, like, turn right on Heather Renee Frank French Boulevard. Boulevard. <laughs> and I went, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, so you, you're like all over. Oh, and it's, you know they have wonderful signs there, yeah, I, I and the signs, the signs in Maysville. And the reason they do that is yeah. because, again, from that David Letterman experience, when yeah. he said, "Where are you from?" I said, "I have two hometowns, Augusta and Maysville." Yeah. And I think because I I recognize both towns as my hometowns because I lived half my life in both and I had family in both. Yeah. That Augusta put up signs that says birthplace. Yeah. Of Heather and A. French. Oh. Maysville then put up signs that says home of I, Heather I and A. French. Uh, and then Augusta okay. came back and raised money, and they have this really nice, um, it looks like a memorial a little bit, I uh-huh. will not lie. But it says where it all began, Heather Renee French, Miss America 2000. Oh, that's neat. And I always say there's just enough room on the bottom for like <laughs> where it all 
ended or oh. something. But it's right in front of the Parkview in bed and breakfast. But, you know, it's huh. Augusta's 1,400 folks, uh, if you yep. count the cats and the dogs. And there's still yep. no flood wall. The ferry boat still goes back and forth. Yep. Uh, Steve and I yep. own and operate the Rosemary Clooney Museum there yeah, and have several other buildings. Yep. And, of course, Rosemary, being a Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky gal herself, yep. sure. um, was a great mentor to me. And Nick and Nina me. still live there in Augusta. Nick and Nina still live there. Nina still runs a store there. So you oh, can no, see oh, really? Nina from time to time. And Such a nice She really loves it. Oh, absolutely. And Nick is always seen walking the dogs. Oh, good. Working at the post. Sure. Nick would hand, or he would type on a typewriter. I think electric even. Wow. And mail his columns into the Inquirer, or to the Inquirer. Ooh. Uh, the yeah. post, the Kentucky <laughs> oh, post. Pa. Oh, oops. Yeah. I mean, I worked at both. But yeah. anyway, you know, I, I, I have great experiences at both of them. But at that time, it was the post and um, very much the post. And he would type them in, type them and mail them in the, the U.S. Postal Service would mail them. And then somebody would type them and then put them in the paper. Uh, and he would come in from time to time. And when I was the president of the Society of Professional Journalists, uh, he uh, emceed uh, when I had Edie Magnus. Uh, oh, okay. Who uh, used to be, is from Cincinnati, who used to work for, for Nick and went on to work for NBC, who's also agreed to be on this podcast, I should say. Uh, we just got to find a time to arrange it. But uh, she, uh, he came and emceed it. And he's never forgotten me. He's run into me and he goes, yeah, you're the guy from SPJ. I remember you. You know, I'm like, that's He has a, an impeccable memory. He's a, and such a friendly guy. So it just... Lots of friendly people in Augusta. And lots of wonderful friendly people in Augusta. And so Rosemary became a huge friend of mine. During She was the second phone call I received after winning Miss America. No kidding. So I was in my suite in New York City uh-huh. the day after, you know, I Is won. Is that the pageant was in Atlantic City? Is in Atlantic City. Uh, it, head Donald office Trump is still related there. It? No, 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 no. That's Miss USA. Different system. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, never so had no any Trump encounter. Stories? No, no Trump stories. <laughs> Darn it. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm in New York City and my traveling companion, a.k.a. chaperone, because Miss America's never alone. And she said, you'll never guess who's on the phone for you. And I'm oh, thinking, really? who? You know, you've just won Miss America. Who else? You know, what yeah, else right. could it be? And she said, Rosemary Clooney. Oh, wow. And, of course, I had met her several times mm-hmm. uh, when I was younger, but didn't really know her, know her, um, but knew the Clooney she was family, probably a big obviously. Deal your whole life, right? Oh, yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, the star, we right? Born, yeah. And so she, we had the most wonderful conversation. She knew what it was like to be from a small town, to be thrust into this, like, instant spotlight. Oh, wow. She gave me all kinds of advice, and we stayed in touch throughout that entire year, and I would go see her perform. She was doing a lot of shows in New York at uh-huh. the Regency on Park Avenue, okay. and the very first show I saw um, of her in this little tiny uh, room, Al Pacino and Beverly D'Angelo were there with me. Oh, it was no like, you know, you realize I'm this little girl from Maysville and Augusta, Kentucky, and here I am. I'm sitting, you know, with wow. Al Pacino and Beverly D'Angelo watching From Rosemary. another little girl who yeah. was from... Maysville right. and, in Augusta, which in Augusta, of? she actually purchased that home. She was raised, um, born in Maysville, bought the home in 1980 to be close to Nick and Nina and mm-hmm. George and Ada, and because George has a sister Ada and she still lives there in town as well. And mm-hmm. so, when she passed away, um, her daughter Monsita called us and asked if we would like to purchase her home. Now, I thought we would purchase it sort of as a place of peace. I've always wanted a place back home in yeah. Maysville or Augusta, and my parents still live up in the Maysville area, but. Quickly, it turned into a museum because we had friends at Paramount Studios, oh, and that's okay. where she did White Christmas. Right. And so four of the five of her films were with Paramount Studios, and so now it's a 100% museum. We have the White Christmas collection, which travels during so the holiday season. So where do you stay season. when you go there? So we stay with my parents. Oh, okay. Are you serious? Hotel Francais. Are you serious? <laughs> nope. My mom is a great cook, so oh, okay. why would I stay anywhere else so, but my parents' Tell house? me, do you have any brothers or sisters? I do. I'm the third of four. Okay. I have an older brother and sister, uh, what, Gretchen and Jeremy, and then do? younger brother, Jameson. Okay. So um, Gretchen is in the food business, and she has two children, and Jeremy is a wonderful carpenter slash he can do everything in tool and die area. He has three area, children. Then? No, they all live in – Jeremy's in, like, Indiana. Gretchen's in Louisville. Okay. Jameson has moved back home to Maysville, but he's a musician. Okay. I brought him to UC for a oh. couple weekends with me. Uh-huh. He wa- I was 11 when he was born. So he and I have quite uh, okay. an age difference. But okay. I am very proud. I introduced him to, you know, his first – orchestral performance and he saw first Uh musical and I really wanted him to I wanted him to embrace the sophisticated sort of city life so I pride myself on really getting him into the arts that's me and so and so you're the second in the birth order third of four oh I'm sorry third of four yeah I'm the third of four I'm the middle child so I've been told no a lot in my life it's all right that's gotcha and they said did you know today was national middle kid day oh no I did not know that it's okay everyone else forgot too (laughs) <laughs> so, Andy, you're funny. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, so what was life like for you when you were a kid? Were you like 
I guess well, I'm kind of where did like, listen in Augusta. So yeah. I was there till we were about eleven. So in a small town like that, which is four blocks long and four blocks wide, which is why people love to come and tour Augusta because it's that yeah. last little Americana town, sure. no stoplights. The entire town is your playground. Like. I was part of, like, the softball team in the summer, and then you uh-huh. ate the free lunches at the school, and the softball field was on the other side of town, so you always rode your bikes. And it was a type of town that, as we all remember growing up, your parents would say, just be home at dark, mm-hmm. you know, for dinner. And then the kids would all meet back up in the summertime around, like, 1030, and you'd play Kick the Can or mm-hmm. Fox and the Hound or whatever it is right. that you played in the neighborhood. And everyone knew everyone. Of course, we, most of us were cousins, probably, too, kind of in that area because we had so much sure. family, um, certainly. But, no, Augusta was a wonderful place. I caught my first fish on the banks of the Ohio River there uh-huh. and used yeah. to ride the ferry boat, you know, back and forth. Yeah. And it's so funny. I'm not sure we were actually even supposed to do that or that we were allowed to do that, but somehow we did. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of a weekly occurrence with us. And, no, it was a fun time. And then we moved to Maysville to go. I wanted to learn how to play the violin. Moved and to the big city. The yeah. big metropolis of yeah. Maysville, Kentucky. And that's where I finally finished That's why you guys moved to Maysville is because you wanted to play the mm-hmm. violin? I wanted to learn how to play the violin. And, and they, they had an orchestral program. Mm-hmm. At the school. Where, where at the school. You, where would, is there an Augusta High School? There is an Augusta Independent Schools, which oh, is yeah. still okay. a public school no, though now. But it's K through 12. And so we are still blessed to have a city in, central school all contained k through 12 wow so you yeah, went to maysville awesome. to went to, to mason to, county to so you could play the violin mm-hmm. so yep. you, did you play then i did yeah from still? fourth grade on i don't have a violin anymore yeah, okay. um but I, I did play the flute uh the trumpet and the xylophone i learned how to play lots of instruments i was a band geek and an orchestra girl and sang okay. in the choir so it was just no right. doubt that I went to UC for design. I mean, it was perfect. Sure. So what did what did mom and dad do? What did it... Mom and dad, so my dad, of course, a, dis- a disabled Vietnam veteran, which yes. is what took me on my tour as Miss America to take on military mm-hmm. and veterans' issues. He had a right. tough time coming home from Vietnam. And mm-hmm. in a small town, it took us a long time to want to talk openly about that. Um, and then his brother wound up a homeless veteran, but was found oh. on the streets of Gainesville, Florida, by the Gainesville VA, put into a homeless veteran reintegration program called the Serenity House in Daytona Beach. Years later, became a counselor there, and then really? just recently retired. So both he and my dad, That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, he and my dad turned their lives around through government-assisted programs mm-hmm. that were in the community. And that's what gave me the inspiration then to go on as Miss America and champion veterans' mm-hmm. issues, which is really what I've been doing the last 20 years. Did your mom work outside the home at all? My mom worked a little outside the home. She worked for the newspaper oh, in good. Bracken hey. County for a while. Oh, so, in Bracken yeah. County. Oh, Apple oh doesn't God. fall far from the tree, yeah, uh, certainly. Oh, cool. I still love our Bracken News. It's a weekly paper, but people love weekly papers, you I know? Bracken I mean, they keep those, certainly. Is and Augusta in Bracken County? Augusta is in Bracken okay, County. Okay, because I yeah. know it's like... It's, it's right on the river. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, well, I, so you have Augusta and Brooksville. Yeah. Brooksville's the county seat. So, okay. mm-hmm. so and you, did you tell me once that George Clooney babysat you when you were a kid? Well, George Clooney played tennis with my dad. Okay. And so we had a pretty he's a lot vibrant. Older than, I would say, I say us because you were born in 1974. Right? I was born in, right, you're in the, the 74, 74 mm-hmm. and I was born at the beginning of the 74 in January. Right. You're born in December. So we're about the same age. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'll be 45 now. this year. 45? Uh, I'm right? 45. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, well, it's... Something like that. Something about that. When I heard 45, I'm like, that kind of sounds old. I don't know. It does. Like, you're just... Mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. A little closer to 50. I don't know about that. So, George is a lot older than us, then. I don't know about a lot older. I just know he was in high school when I was younger. Okay. And so, he played tennis with my dad. Mm-hmm. And then, when my dad would play mixed doubles, because there was a big tennis community in those days in that area. Mm-hmm. And so, then he would watch all the kids. And he loved... I mean, he was such a prankster. But yeah, I used to have this really long hair, and I would wear pigtails. <laughs> and he always called me Piggy Sue. And so the first time I saw him after I won Miss Kentucky, I was in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And Rosemary and the Clooney family were being honored by the Chandler Foundation for some of their philanthropic work. And so Nick, I think George was filming Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And he'd come into town. And Nick said, hey, George, turn around. I want you to say hi to someone. And as soon as he turned around, he goes, oh, my God, I still have bruises on my shins from you kicking me at the tennis court and it was just like (laughs) yeah because that's what you want him to remember about you right that you know you kicked him but I used to tell him because he would call me Piggy Sue and I would say I'm going to sue you you know because I mean he was it was funny though no he was he he's such a a wonderful human being then and he still is now his whole family yeah yeah. I feel like I've met everybody I've met some of his nieces and I was going to when you mentioned his sister lived there I can't remember her name but I Ada Mm -hmm. well their sister but I think her daughter or daughters I, we kept in touch for a while, and I'm just thinking when you said that, I'm like, I don't ever know what happened. Like, I don't, 
I can't even remember her name, but that's part of being 45, I guess. But Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> but I'm thinking, I wonder what happened to her. But now, I feel like I know half the Clooney family or met half the Clooney family. And they're so nice, but they I've never are. met George, never seen George. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, oh, no. I don't wonderful, even know what he looks like. Wonderful you know? human being. Of course he's handsome. That was um, a joke. And, way, but, but he and Amal, um, from time to time, come home yeah. to Augusta with the babies. But, you know, he's done well for himself. And, it, you know, it's something Rosemary always encouraged, though, that no matter where you go, never forget where you come from. And yeah. I think I think all of us, as we get older, start to get a bit nostalgic about yeah, making sure. sure we're supporting where we've come from. And Augusta and Maysville are like that for me. So I've traveled all over the world. I've done, I'm not done doing lots of big things, I don't think. But mm-hmm. of all the things that I've done, I still keep sort of looking back over my shoulder and saying, you know, one day... I'd like to retire back to that area and then sure. maybe teach up at UC at DAP, which that'd would be, be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be neat. So how did you get into the beauty pageant stuff? So you, you're growing up in Augusta. You tell well, me a little bit. you know, from a small town area, I think everyone in Kentucky, when you're from a small rural area, there's always the county fair or the local festival started? pageant. So, yeah, I mean, okay. we all did like the Germantown Fair system and Ewing Fleming County Fair, Tollsboro Fair, you name mm-hmm. it. Uh, we tried to do it, certainly. And in those days, it was just a lot of fun. It was like any other thing that you're involved in, right? So I was also involved in musical theater um, growing up, in church and Girl Scouts and all kinds of things. So the pageants to me was just another extension, another activity that I knew I was good at. I loved being on stage. I loved performing, obviously. I could answer um, pretty good question uh, when I asked, certainly. And then, of course, the platform issue that much later on in life. But I had always... Did you set, with a goal, set out with a goal? Of being Miss America. You know, when I was four years old... I remember having a dream that I became Miss America. Huh, interesting. And a young girl at a homecoming hymn sing at a local church, my family sang Southern gospel music. And so she asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I just told her matter of factly, I remember like it was yesterday, I said, I'm going to be Miss America. Really? And it just, but it wasn't one of those like crazy fanatical paths. Like, you thought it might happen. It wasn't toddlers and tiaras, you know, that half that stuff doesn't even exist. But I had a dream I was going to be a podcast host. Yeah. And here you and, are. Here I am. See how that dream comes true? Right. So I know what you mean. So, but I I did not realize at the time, of course, the work that uh-huh. goes into it, certainly. And I didn't realize the whole scholarship component and community support component of it. But I started competing for Miss America specifically when I was about a sophomore. And, you know, in a five-year program. School, sophomore. No, sophomore in college. Oh, really? You, you didn't could, do it in high school at all? Well, I did the county fair stuff. Okay. So did you, you had win to be, stuff then? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like what? what did you like Miss Ewing Fleming County Fair, Miss okay. Hillsboro Fair, like Junior Miss, and all that. And, kind and of what stuff. would you take to win that? Was it the same kind of thing that you no, would take to no, win? No, no, no. County Fair is totally different. It's it's much easier. But I will say that I am the only Miss America. I think now that I've talked to all my sisters about it that have ridden around a horse rink at a county fair with organ music playing <laughs> on the back of a convertible in a swimsuit and an evening gown. <laughs> and they let you off in the center stage to then compete. So in those days, that's what you did, certainly. Oh, really? huh. But, you know, all great, fun experience for me. But Miss America, you had to be uh, 18 to 24 at oh, really? the time. Oh, really? I thought it was like a high school type thing, but it's, no, it's, it's no, really no. a college age. Yeah, it's college okay. age because you, what you win is college scholarship. Oh, okay. Which yeah. makes sense, right? So then I started, I waited until my sophomore year to start competing for Miss America. But my first experience competing for Miss America was actually in Miss Ohio because I was at the that? University of Cincinnati. Are you a carpetbagger coming yeah, up to Ohio? Yeah, pretty much. They called us state hoppers, no doubt, right? Oh, state yeah, ho- oh, right. exactly. But I was at school at University of Cincinnati. And oh, so okay. I qualified. And in those days, pre internet, you know, uh-huh. uh, no one from Miss Kentucky would return my phone call. Maybe I wasn't oh. calling the right phone number. I don't know. But I competed as Miss Pickerington. I won a preliminary. Pickering, where's, Pickerington. Pickerington oh, is Dayton, that near right? Columbus. Columbus. Yep. Okay. A little suburb of Columbus. So, you, so that's so, where you have to win like a city? Yeah, you got to oh. win. Well, you have to win a prelim. It doesn't have to necessarily be a city name. Like okay. many years later, I went on in Kentucky to win a title called Miss Heart of the Thoroughbred. I, pff, I don't even know okay. what that meant, but whatever. So it meant you could run really fast. Yeah, maybe know. you know. Okay. So I won Miss Pickerington. I get to Miss Ohio. I get top ten. Mm-hmm. I did not know at the time that these states all kind of watch each other, and so they found uh. out there was this Kentucky girl who did really well uh. in Miss Ohio. Okay. So then I got a phone call or two, and I was like, "Hey." you should like, you know, try out for Miss Kentucky instead of Miss Ohio. And since my residence was still Kentucky, I was paying out of state, crazy. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. for UC now, every cool. high school yeah, student the, in Kentucky can get, you know, in-state reciprocity uh, mm-hmm. fee, so, which is good. But um, I went then back to Kentucky and won Miss Lexington, and that started my trek. So it took me five years to win a state title. And you can only win one state title, and you only get one chance at Miss America. So by the time that oh. happened, I was in graduate school. I was teaching. I was also working at the Environmental Protection Agency doing some art director uh, ish stuff for them, and I almost didn't compete my last year. I just had a lot going on, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of life decisions to make. I had job offers from different companies around the country, and my dad got really sick. And he said, "I want you to try one more time. Our veterans need a Miss America." And he almost died. So that really put well, me on what, a different trajectory. Of, how did he almost die? Well, he got pneumonia, and oh it went gosh. toxic, and so oh, no. they had to induce a coma, and that was, we thought we lost him, but he told me that right before he went into a coma, and it just, it changed my perspective about why I was competing, mm-hmm. and it also gave me sort of the authority to take on our family story, because we just didn't really talk about some of his dilemma coming home from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of those I don't, times, don't want to talk about it. No, and as a family, sometimes there's that stigma of, of mental health and substance abuse, mm-hmm. and you're ashamed. And when you're from a small town, you don't. Did like your dad to, have mental health issues? He or? did. Yeah, okay. PTSD, co-occurring issues with PTSD and substance abuse with some medication, and that wasn't uncommon. Um, so, I, have I you had to learn to deal with kind of being like a, an adult child of a person who abused? Yeah, I mean, have you done that kind of work too? Or? Well, sure. So that's what put me on the path the last twenty years, and so I have traveled for across your own the country self, though, too. Well, I've shared my story uh in dealing with that and advocating more for resources for families and children of persons that have dealt with substance abuse issues and PTSD, but mostly in the military veteran community. And so I have a foundation for veterans that we've worked with. And then in 2014, I actually went on to become the commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs. Yeah, I saw that. And I'd love to talk about that as well, too. But I, I, I think there must be some wounds from, like, your dad watching your dad go through this experience and the effect on the family and that? Is that something, like, by telling his story, is that how you've learned to kind of heal from that a little bit? It's interesting. Or Um, have you done any kind of, like, support group work? Well, of the children, so being the third of four, I seem to have connected um, maybe a bit closer to my dad, understanding from an early age that he was going through something that wasn't necessarily his fault, yeah. Like he was going, he was trying to numb something that happened to him. Right. And so from a very early age, I recognized something different and unique. And I would go to the VA hospital with my parents. And so I saw other people going through the same thing. So I knew we weren't alone. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what it is within me that recognized that earlier on or maybe more sympathetic maybe to that issue. Mm-hmm. But when dad was able to finally turn his life around and Uncle Jerry was able to turn his life around, I knew that when I won Miss Kentucky and then Miss America that it was going to be vital to share that story because we were at a pivotal point in our American history and in government where we were not recognizing and not funding resources enough for families and veterans that were going through this. And this was pre-9-11. Yeah. Now, I mean, so many people forget the lack of resources we had pre-9-11. It, and now, because of 9-11, the silver lining around that tragedy is that it woke a nation up to what we needed um, for veterans and military. And so now we, we've never had more resources than we have now. Still could be better. It's, uh, it can always be better. But when I think about what we didn't have, I mean, around the country at the time, in 99, we only had five centers of excellence for mental health in the VA hospital. And now every VA hospital has mental health services, and they pride themselves on that. Women veterans health services as well. I mean, that was not inclusive in all right. VA hospitals. Yeah. And now 20 years later, because of things that we advocated for then, mm-hmm. We have we have seen those um, come to fruition, which I think is awesome. See, and people like your dad, and I, was he drafted? No, he actually volunteered for See, Vietnam. <laughs> that's amazing to me because I'm the kind of guy I always I have tremendous respect for them. I just um, and and people say that I, oh you know thank you for your service sure all that kind of stuff I don't even like saying that because to me it just seems like. I know it's in my heart what I feel. I could never have done what your dad. I don't know if I would have been drafted. I don't, you know, if there was a draft, I don't know what I could have done. I always right. joked I'd be like the guy killed in basic and say, what'd you say, Sarge? I said, get down. You know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be pulling me off basic training feel like, well. You'd be in KT. Lost a, we lost, well, I'd be, probably be dead because they would be like doing live fire damage. Well, I but, couldn't you know, do it. I couldn't. So I just. All of our veterans appreciate, though, when you do say thank you for your service. Do they? Yeah, I, they I, do. 
I mean, I, I'll say it in another way, maybe, because I feel like thank you for your service is like saying good morning. I mean, it's like doesn't really. Well, but the fact that people recognize, because especially in our older generations, you know, people mm-hmm. for many, many years um, did not recognize their service, especially uh, Vietnam veterans, Korean veterans. You know, a lot of people gloss over the Korean War, especially. Yeah. But we celebrate the service of our young men and women now because mm-hmm. of what Vietnam veterans did not get when they came home. Yeah, it's a direct there's a direct, re, uh, oh, it's absolutely. cause and effect. It I mean, absolutely be, is a cause and effect. I mean, and it, it's, you know, we weren't alive during that time, but I can only imagine. What Coming was, home to a country that didn't want you home? Didn't want you home. Can you imagine that? I couldn't imagine what I it was know. like and whether, you know, the popularity of the war, you know, as it got less popular as it sure. went on. These guys, you know, your dad volunteered, but he didn't say, oh, I'm volunteering to go to Vietnam. I'm going, I, I'm maybe, I don't know. But going to serve my country. That's he's there to he serve did. his country. Yeah. He's like, he doesn't want to go to Vietnam and get shot at, right? right. No, he wants to serve his country. He did his duty, certainly. Right. And I could, I, I just don't think I would have, I would have been killed well, in basic training. And you know, and now in our country, less than 1% do sign up to answer that call of duty. Whereas, so I became the chair of the World War One Centennial Commemoration a few years ago mm. um, because of the 100th anniversary right, of the U.S. Year. involvement in the war and and yep. it was interesting, you know, 100% of our society in World War One and World War Two were in, encompassed into military preparations. You know, your families made things, they rationed food, mm-hmm. you know, they made clothes. So many people answered that call of duty to go into war. And now today, so few people are actually touched by and, you know, immediately touched by military service that mm-hmm. we're starting to lose that sense of reality of what war is and the cost of war. We see it on television, but we don't necessarily see it here. Now, we just, of course, 9-11 anniversary yesterday, you know, that was a wake-up call for our country. And unfortunately, it seems that we as Americans always have to have some sort of tragic moment Mm -hmm. for us to sort of wake back up to reality and go, man, we can do better than this. We need to come back together. We need to understand each other more, be kinder to one another, support our military. You know, military, it's so funny, in those of us who work in it and um, advocate for our military veterans, it isn't about loving war. It's about being prepared and advocating for peace. You have strong defense, Mm -hmm. so you can have peace. Yeah. And, and people that's forget really, that sometimes. People do forget that. And they forget that we've had it so good for so long now. So I don't want to see us go back, circle back around to where we've grown apathetic once again. Sure. So with with your journey then winning Miss America and then picking up the veterans and homeless veteran issue, did it help your dad heal? Oh, my dad is Mr. America these days. Are you serious? Okay. I heard he you talked, say that to somebody yeah, else. He actually, yeah. he traveled so much during my Miss America year when people could not get me because I was booked you know, going a million miles an hour, they would fly my parents out to appearances. They traveled all over the really? country. And that and helped he his sharing, healing process? Oh, yeah. The more, and any therapist will tell you, you know, the more you talk about your issue, yep. not only does it help you, but it helps others as well. So sure. dad has been able to share his story uh, quite a bit. And, you know, and PTSD is something that never fully goes away. So there are moments that I still recognize when, you know, he's getting a little tired or you see that he's getting a little yeah. worn down and mm-hmm. you just kind of, you learn those triggers um, if he's in a loud crowd or if mm-hmm. there's something that you think might bring back. You just, right. you know, to keep him away or be a little more or extra sensitive. That's amazing that you, that gift you could give him. I mean, well, you, it's, it's, I used to pray. He was a wonderful athlete in high school and he gave up his Olympic play? dreams. He was a pole vaulter. Oh, no kidding. And okay. he gave up his Olympic dreams to serve, to go to Vietnam. And so. Was he really going to be a contender? Oh, oh yeah. He huh. was just a foot off the world record. Really? And so wow. when. When I was young, I used to pray every night that I could do a sport, you know, well enough to get a uh-huh. gold medal so my dad could, like, attend uh-huh. an Olympic So was he, like, written ceremony. about the papers and stuff? Yeah, he it, was. And really? Woodford, he, What's he his was name? I'm sorry. Ronnie French. Ronnie French, so, okay. So um, he was in the Methodist Home for Boys and Girls, and that's where he was raised in Versailles in Woodford County. Mm-hmm. And um, he was written up in the paper there about he being was the raised next Olympian. In, does that mean he was an orphan? Well, his mother died when he was five, and his brother oh was three, God. and okay. his dad um, just felt like they, he couldn't take care of them, wow. and so he sent them to the Methodist home. So my dad and Uncle Jerry were there until I think my dad was a junior in high school, and then Papa came, got them, brought them back to Augusta, and he graduated from Augusta, but he spent a lot of his adolescent formative years in Woodford County, 
And that was a much bigger school system. So he was like football, basketball, baseball, track star. Yeah. But he was written up there as, as being the next Kentucky Olympian hopeful. No kidding. Yeah. And then he went to Vietnam and he was wounded and kind of ended his track career. But I told Where him Where did you meet when, your mom? What's your mom's name? What's well, you her uh, name Diana too? French. Okay. Yeah. They met in Augusta. So he okay. would come back home periodically to visit they his dad. They meet high school or So or? they met when, well, of course, you know, in, in Augusta, they're... The school's all together, K through 12, so it's a little mm-hmm. weird to say middle school and high school because it's not set up how we know it, mm-hmm. as in separate schools, right. certainly. Okay. But they met, I think, when they were in, uh, I think mom said seventh grade or eighth grade, and dad's okay. a few years older than she is. Okay. Um, but they were boyfriend and girlfriend forever, oh, uh, okay. and obviously married and had four still married, kids. Right? Still married, celebrated yeah. their 50th wedding anniversary last oh, year, certainly. Um, but what is really great is that I used to pray to win an Olympic gold medal so I could see my dad celebrate that because he uh, couldn't do it. And sure. so I told him after I won Miss America, I was like, Dad, this is the best I can, I can no. do. I don't think I'm ever going to win an Olympic gold medal. go back, gold. try, try harder. Dad no, no. said he, he thought that was good enough. <laughs> he so. thought that was good, good. <laughs> well, I'll say now, thank you for your service, Mr. French. Oh, that's I, great. I, thank I, you. I, now that I know that it, that means something, it I, does. I mean, I, I don't want it to sound like a cliche. That's the worst no. thing. I mean, they appreciate sound- being recognized. Well, yeah, and it sounds like you know the the the, the changes to his life were just more than just the, the years that he was in the service. So oh, certainly, he's still well. And paying military the price or- sure. Military service has a pretty vast ripple effect to children mm-hmm. and grandchildren of veterans, and it, it will not only you know mentally but physically. I mean, they're still researching exposures to Agent Orange and other dioxins yeah. on grandchildren of Vietnam veterans. So we're going to see that continue for another couple of years. The really interesting, crazy thing is that you know having an undergraduate and a master's from UC, right? So I'm a designer by trade. Yep is that I've because of Miss America, it takes you on this weird path, right? It kind of gets you off of what your life's path was. Okay, and yeah. so I've done this really bizarre world of traveling all over, doing government work. You know, I've mm-hmm. worked with the White House and Department of Defense and everything mm-hmm. else. And I, I did have a line of clothing and still have an online store. So I wanted to get that back in my life. Okay. But being a designer. And stuff you all designed. Absolutely. Who makes it then? Um, well, we had other manufacturers from all over the world okay. um, making those. And I had 150 retailers from all over the world carrying um, my product, which was awesome. Every designer wants to see their name on a label. Of sure. Course. Okay. So yeah. I wow. achieved that. That's like my check mark, bucket okay. list. But then when but you come back around, uh, no, I have an online store. Okay. Um, I carry other re- uh, other designers things as well. But so anyway, so okay. I come full circle around and people often ask because I've led a statewide department in Kentucky government, a very big department, 910 employees, $102 million budget, and they go, well, what was your education in? And when I tell them design, they sort of, you know, cock their head to the side. And I said, you know what? We need more creative people and designers working in government because we learn to utilize resources in a very creative, unique way. We learn Uh to utilize creative partnerships with community-based organizations or business organizations to actually get work done that government can't do itself. And sometimes when you've been inside that government bubble for so long – you just don't, you can't see the forest for sure, the trees, absolutely. right? So as a designer, yeah. you're a natural problem solver. That's who we are. So when you tell me that, you know, we need a program to serve women veterans, but we don't have a women veterans coordinator, well, you know, my mind immediately goes to work Get and one. says, okay, well, we're going to have to, you know, plan out an entire year, women veterans activities. Let's mm. do a promotional program. Let's figure out the resources that we can pull together to hire a women veterans coordinator. And then bam, in 2015, we did women veterans United 2015 and finally got our first women veterans full-time coordinator. Mm. And that really sort of hit the mark for us because women veterans are going to be a huge population for us in the future. Mm-hmm. And it was something that we'd overlooked. So as a designer, I look at things I'm able to bring to the table in a creative way. And that all stems from, you know, my education training. Right. So what is it like being Miss America? Miss America and, and is, is it, awesome. Is it? And so, and there's all this like stigma now around, you know, objectifying women and they took away the swimsuit competition. I right. think of the evening gown competition has gone. No, well, they only took away swimsuit. What do you think about all that? Is so it, I was on it, the national board when we did that. So, okay. oh, really? you know, so, so Miss America will be 100 years old next year. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. How's she doing? Miss oh, America's I'm doing, yeah. Miss America's doing great. Um, so, yeah. 
what's interesting about Miss America, we've always been and tried to be a reflection of society. So when we first started, it was a bathing suit competition that extended the holiday in Atlantic City. The JCs put it on. Oh. So then it moved from being just a bathing suit competition. Then you add like evening wear in. And then all of a sudden you add talent in. And then all of a sudden scholarship comes into play. So you see it paralleling how women are, you okay. know, the, the role of women in society is changing. And so when you get into the 2000s, obviously our platform became the larger part of mm-hmm. the program. And that's why I was able to make such great strides. But then we hit a mark in like 2012, 2013, where women's roles started to change once again. And now then, you know, we just kind of bypassed sort of the, the Me Too movement. And mm-hmm. I tell you what, any sort of organization that had women at the forefront in a physical capacity that it just, it made us kind of pause to go, how are we now going to reflect what women want to be and seen as? And so swimsuit just seemed to be one of those pieces that was less than, like six minutes at the telecast, mm-hmm. less than like 5% of the score, you know, was it really going to it change? It could be some people's favorite part, maybe. It, well, it could be, but really you only watch for six minutes of the program. I mean, <laughs> I it, it's just, so yeah. when we put it in context like that, you had half your fans that were like, yeah, that's not all of who Miss America is. Mm-hmm. Who's her target audience? Then, who are they looking? I mean, who? Well, we have a pretty wide target audience, right? So, you know, when your age, I think it was like 35 and older mm. is probably our biggest age range that watched the show. Okay. But you also, you know, everybody wants to capture the younger audience, certainly. But sometimes that's not always easy to do in this social media society where no one's watching television. You know, right. they're watching yeah. Hulu and Netflix and, mm-hmm. you know, Amazon Prime and um, everything else under the sun and becoming YouTubers. So television Television of itself has changed drastically. Quite a bit, yeah. And so, if you really see how long Miss America has lasted, it's kind of a marvel that it has lasted this long, certainly. So, you think it'll continue? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think as long as you recognize any organization, as long as you recognize the need to change, mm. but still keep your traditional maybe platform or values of, you know, we are still Miss America. It's mm-hmm. not, it's not a path for every woman, certainly, but for a lot of young women, it gives millions of dollars in scholarship and it's a fun thing to do. So I tell people all the time, Miss America, especially the televised part is like the gala for any organization um, to, you know, to raise money. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's the night that raises the awareness about what we do. But 364 other days of the year, that organization is running and providing uh, vital services for other young women around the country. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know, and and I think that explains a lot more of it. Yeah. And I started with the question, what is it like to be Miss America? And I totally cut you off, so I apologize. No, I'm kind of new at this still. I'm working on it. Being Miss America was a phenomenal experience. It was an exhausting experience. I mean, Mm -hmm. it puts you on this path that is going so fast. And if there's one thing that I always say to younger Miss Americas when they're crowned is... you talk to younger Miss Americas? Oh, yeah. We're all pretty tight. It's a pretty tight sisterhood, certainly. Okay. We've had our own ups and downs, certainly. But I think in the end, it's a very unique experience. We actually refer to people who aren't Miss Americas as civilians. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Just because... So I'm a civilian. You, because, like, I never could win that. Well, but. you would... There's, there's no, no way... There's no Mr. America. There's no way for me to be able to describe to you... Um, what it's truly like and for you to understand so because the, the world has a perception of us that is totally different than the reality of who we are and it it becomes, you wear a crown and all that stuff and yeah but you don't wear it all the time i yeah. mean you, you wear it as part of sort of the costume of what it is mm. certainly to be miss america but the experience and the work that you do as miss america never gets the respect that it's due. And even 20 years later, like I have people obviously who get excited to see me as Miss America, which is great. But then there are also equally just as many people who have a misperception. And then I have to destroy that myth in the first five seconds I meet them. Now it's a Mm. little more liberating when you realize that's just going to be what it is. So when I'm 80 and you know, people say, Oh, you were Miss America. I realize that Whatever they think of me is what they're going to think of the entire organization before and after. So it's pretty, it's a heavy burden 
um, as far as the identification of an entire organization and all of its participants, but um, it's one well worth it. I mean, the opportunities I've received as being Miss America, nothing else could compare to that. So what's the most amazing thing you got to do that, that time that you were just like, I never thought this was going to happen. I didn't know this huh. was part of the deal. Well, listen, there were so many because I was working with one. military. No. I cannot <laughs> pick just one. So a few of them. So obviously, um, I had a great opportunity to perform with Walter Conkright and Charles Osgood at the Carnegie Hall. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you're and going after so me now. This, I was, yeah. yeah. My target audience there. Okay. <laughs> so I was doing a, a narrative piece called I Am an American. Uh-huh. And I really did not know the piece until I got there. We had one rehearsal. Uh-huh. And here I am standing between Walter Cronkite and Charles Osgood. Yeah, and it was a trio, right two legend legends, right? Yeah. They are the epitome. And I am doing this piece with them at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Unbelievable. Did you tell them you worked at the news record? I probably did. No. I, I bet you I did. I bet you I, and they probably said, what? What? Yeah. Um, so I UC? got to do I mean, things like California? that. I yeah. performed at the Kennedy Center. Um, I was on the USS Intrepid and introduced the president and his family. I got to mm. work with the White House. And I'll never forget on Veterans Day that year, mm-hmm. I actually was in a holding room with Secretary uh, Cohen, who was Secretary of Defense, oh, yep. mm-hmm. Togo West, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, okay. and uh, President Clinton, and it was the four of us, and we were sequestered for an hour before a ceremony, and they were all asking me questions about my platform as Miss America. Really? It was unbelievable to have, I mean, how many international leaders would love to have that audience Why were you guys hour. sequestered for an hour? So we were about ready to do the ceremony up at Arlington Cemetery. And mm-hmm. so they we had had to arrive that early because you had so many people coming in to Arlington. So security had to do their sweep. And it was the only time we had to actually get in before the crowd got in. Oh, I see. Because there was really no physical way. He wasn't going to fly in or drop down from a helicopter. So uh, there's uh. a holding room underneath the facility, and so that's where we were, and it was pretty amazing. So, the president you think, was taking like I'm sitting notes. here with the president of the United oh, yeah, States and right. the defense secretary, I mean, and crazy. So the whole time I'm going, I can't believe I'm here. What was he like? Was he unbelievable? They were all very um, interested, professional or... very professional, all very interested in what I was talking about because I was specifically talking about homeless veterans. So I noticed the president making notes, really. And so when we got up to do, he got up to do the speech. My family and I, because my parents were up there as well, we were seated in one of the boxes um, that is around in the mm-hmm. little rotunda area. And when he got up to speak, I was just one box away from him. And he actually, on national television, had me stand and thanked me for all the work that I was wow. doing as uh, Miss America for Homeless Veterans. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. I mean, who would have ever thought? So that's a... To me, from a small town in Augusta, Maysville, it's not bad. It's a pretty big deal. Not bad. I think I'll chalk that up on my bucket list too. Pretty yeah. Good. So, what's the worst? Thing? Any kind of weird thing happen, or just like? Yeah, I think the weirdest thing, and it still continues to happen, is that people just don't understand uh, Miss America by and large. And I've had, you know, people make jokes. Oh, are you the Derby Princess? I, I really didn't wear my crown very often, oh. um, but when I did have to wear it for things, people just lose all sense of reality, and mm-hmm. you know, they kind of go goo goo gaga, and the the conversation goes from, you know, how do you feel about the budget for the Department of Veterans Affairs? To all of a sudden, you put the crown on, it's like, oh, how does the crown? stay on you know i mean Mm -hmm. so it changes the entire perspective you went from being like unknown except for to me and people at the news record and a few other people to being like this celebrity-ish kind of like i mean this america is not like celebrity yeah right and it is what you make it so you called it you said a b level i think yeah Yeah. b level celebrity certainly and it depends on the year because i was fascinated by that because you have people who just you know like here at the sheriff's oh heather's coming you know and they know you because of this Miss America, and then you were on television, which we haven't even talked about yet. But you did – how long did you do the TV show? I was only on for about a year and a half, but you would think that people – that it was just yesterday. People were always like, I miss you on Fox in the morning. And mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, that was forever ago. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So what – like, what is, is that weird to deal with that? People no, just coming up to you and saying, oh, I, I know that, you, but I don't really – No, you I think that people – They know people, you, but you don't know them. No, I think you get used to that. Um, I've never really seen that as as odd. And I think my children have grown up in a very public way. They may see it more as infringement on their freedom, but... 
they're so used to it now. I mean, from the time they were born, they don't know anything different. And they know that when we go to the state fair, when we go to the grocery, people are going to stop us and talk to us. And, mm-hmm. and they've um, grown very, uh, they very grown? used to Cause it. Because my, my, my stepson groans a lot. Does he He's groan? Like, does he know everybody? And yeah. Because I know, I mean, I'm not a celebrity. But I know people from being a reporter and sure. just being me because I'm just like, hey, I think when they were you. little, it was a little more irritating because they were just wanting to go, right? They, yeah, it on, was just get... a patience issue. Oh, and now okay. yeah. they understand it. And now they kind of have to participate because my girls, I mean, we had to do news conferences, when press conferences when they were born. I mean, Kentucky just really loved the story of Steve and I getting married and having kids. I mean, yeah. it was a big deal to them. So people Steve? have watched them. He was lieutenant governor of Kentucky, um, you know, for eight years. And during his time, he had to host all the Miss Kentucky contestants for a brunch oh. at the lieutenant governor's mansion. So I actually met him. And he was single at the time. He was, well, yeah, I'm mean, his met- first wife. Okay. Yeah, right, first okay. and only, hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he he had to host all of us for a lunch. And I knew the first year I met him that I was going to marry him one day. I just knew. Really? Yeah, it was just the most random Because he's thing. older than you, right? Is he? 20 years older. But oh, wow. he, okay. he has more energy by far than I. He is a notable trauma orthopedic surgeon right uh, not just a, a politician okay. and um no we have a very interesting life i there are days i wish it is was a what, quieter life but it is a, a hectic life what what attracted you to and what it would like what do you need to, what, there was just i think a common desire to serve okay and we both run at the same type of pace and understand what it means to be a public servant. Now, yeah. I will say he by far has more energy than I have, and I think that yeah, really. um, probably can attribute that to him being a trauma surgeon, mm-hmm. where he's just his adrenaline's always going all the time. I tend to, when I'm in an appearance, I tend to give of myself all like a hundred percent. I don't know how to keep anything, you know, back for myself. So by the end of the day, I'm just. I get wiped out and just want to look, stare at a wall. You know, basically, I have to uh-huh. re-energize. So maybe I that's see. the artist part of me. Okay, yeah. that I just need to I get, be I get that. refilled, uh, certainly. Mm-hmm. And he just never seems to need that. It just really, keeps just going. keeps going. Really, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, dude, I, got, I need so, to watch a movie. <laughs> yeah, you know, right, and he's just like, let's do another thing. Let's yeah, do something else. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so how long have you been married now? Then um, almost 20 years. No kidding. Yeah. Right. We, again, that's so, uh, that oh, sounds old too. I guess this will be our 19th year. So next year is officially our 20th year because we. We were um, married October 27th of 2000. And so 14 girls. days after my Miss America year. Uh, two girls, Harper yeah. and Taylor, 16 and 18 now. No yep. kidding. And so, and they're like, they, they know mom's kind of a big deal. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I think, I don't, well, big deal in relation to what? I mean, not to Julia Roberts, no. Um, but in Kentucky, you know, mm-hmm. certainly they Her understand. mom knows George Clooney, right? Well, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> but, in, but in the realm of people needing things, expecting, I mean, like even here, you know, people asking, hey, can you help my dad or help my mom who's a veteran? We've got this problem. They know that our family is a family uh, that's service driven. Mm-hmm. And so I think that they are slowly becoming even more aware that they with like that it. becomes, I, you know, there are days that I think they don't mind it. And there are days that I think they probably do because they, it, you know, there, there's a amount of stress that comes to that, that people, there's a large amount of people that want you to heal their problem or, uh, yeah. or get the answers to a problem that they've had, had trouble getting. And so they know that I always want to deliver 100%. And so I think they see a little bit of that emotional wear and tear on me. But And there's always going to be days that you're not perfect for everybody and you didn't get the answer that they wanted. And people are, may blame you for not getting what they feel they were entitled to. But, you know, you just do the best you can. So – how did the TV thing come along then? That was later that you said, how long, and you said, how long ago was yeah, it? You, did you know what? It was back in 2001, 2002, really? oh, 2002, it? I think was when I did television. And then I did, you know, several like episodes. I had done Hollywood squares and I did the $25,000 pyramid okay. uh, with some Miss America. I did, uh, Oh, what's the, the who's line? Not whose line is it? It was the song show with uh, Wayne Brady. Um, so oh. we did a couple episodes okay. of that, certainly with some Miss America sisters. So you're all, you know, what's weird about Miss America is you always get these weird opportunities like this mm-hmm. because you have so much experience during your year with media that it's just one step into another direction and you could be on a sitcom or you could be on mm-hmm. a national talk show. And so many Miss Americas travel down that path because 
that's what you're exposed to your entire yeah. year. Every day is a speech. Every day is media. I mean, you have media trainers. I mean, Richard Valeriani and David Horowitz, which are two big old media mogul names from the 70s, they trained presidents. They were my media trainer. Really? Yeah. So you're trained by the best. So how am I doing? You're doing pretty good. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. you're doing pretty well. <laughs> so I'm like, you could be doing this to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm interviewing you, but you're actually interviewing me. I right, really right, am, right, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, this, so then you did, what was it you did? You you were, people in Cincinnati we were, won't know this because. Right. I was a morning show host. You know, might have heard. It, but getting into the, you know, office at 4 a.m. in the morning, going mm-hmm. on at 5. And at the Fox at affiliate nine, in At Louisville? WDRB. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, I asked you're just one like of my being agents. being an anchor, right? Well, a show host, you know, we had an anchor that did the hardcore news. They didn't okay. want us to do the A-list news, which oh, is, you okay. know, your bleeding and leading sort of news. But, you know, we had all of the hosts. You developed those segments for that. So, I mean, you were eating barbecue at 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. doing Oh, because you had the barbecue thing. guy in, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so it was great community tie-in, but I never thought that I would ever go down that route. But one of my agent friends, I called him and I said, listen, I've been offered this job. And he said, well, you know, do it for a couple of years, but don't do it any more than that because morning news will age you. Oh, yeah. And he was exactly right. I was exhausted. Harper mm-hmm. was um, a baby and it was, Stephen was still in office and it was tough, a mm-hmm. schedule certainly, because the world doesn't revolve around you getting off at like 10 a.m. in the morning and you're exhausted because you've been working for the last nine hours or eight hours. And all of a sudden I had to go on the road with him to do appearances as his wife as lieutenant governor. And then Mm -hmm. I had my own Miss America stuff. I was still doing national, you know, issues and appearances. And no, it was, it was good experience. I'm glad I did it. Um, If I ever had the opportunity to do it again, I don't know. I think I'd be much more on a national platform to want to do that, but mm-hmm. um, nothing. But nothing gives you that inside scoop like working so for what, the news media. So, did you always think? And so now, as we're sitting here, you are here campaigning. I um, hopefully, am. this is a break from that. This is what. Yeah, no, it's nice. But Absolutely. We got, yeah, but we got to talk about that a little bit because that's going to be on the the front of a lot of people's minds. So, you're running for the Secretary, Secretary of State. State. So, the last 20 years, most people assumed when I came home from Miss America because I was so entrenched in government and legislative mm-hmm. policy that they assumed that I would run for an office. Now, Did I was you? not born in a political family. Like, uh-huh. no one ever asked my family. So you didn't for a assume that? No, not at all. In fact, I moved as far away from it as possible while still being married to someone who was in office. And then I became commissioner of KDVA. And then for one administration, and the current administration kept me on as deputy commissioner. So for f- nearly five years, I led a very large department. And then the Secretary of State's office. And that was opened your job. Up. That and was, that was that, that's a like a Monday that's a job job. That that's is a oh yeah. That is more hours than what you're actually putting in on your timesheet sort of job. And yeah. it was a large department, with large administrative responsibilities. I found out through that job that I am I have a great aptitude for administration, mm. and I knew I always loved legislative policy because what I did a lot as Miss America. And but could handle a very large budget. We had four veterans nursing homes, five state veterans cemeteries, lots of services across the Commonwealth. And I just have an aptitude for that kind of service, which is mm-hmm. nice. But Secretary of State, we had actually worked with that office on some of their veteran platforms. Mm-hmm. And so when that office opened up, the current Secretary of State turns out, um, I decided and that's, uh, that... That's Allison Lindergren Grant. Mm-hmm. And right. so I decided that since we had had a lot of cross-cooperation uh, with that uh, department or that office, that I should probably take a step in that direction uh, to lead that office and to take on some of the issues that I see as pressing and see if my experience with a much larger department and budget could help. Did I read you did very well in the primary, is it? I did do very well in the primary. That's a, Heather, I'm so happy for you. Just, <laughs> Thank you. I just think that you're this little designer from the news record. And I am. And you are, but you're still just Heather. I mean, it's, you know. I am just it's, Heather, It's yes. just amazing. I mean, I just, I'm somebody, I just, I'm so happy for the people I know, friends, even though we're not close friends. I mean, but you're always, every time you, I've seen you in the past 20 years, you're always like, hey, it's, you know. It's so neat to see the success you've had Thank you. and that I you're just that. still Heather. You know? Well, I am still Heather. And at the end of the day, you know, I just, I've always told people, I want to be the same person you meet in the morning that you're going to meet, you know, in the evening. There's, 
you know, whether you're the president of the United States or a homeless veteran, it should always be the same personality. And that's what I hope that at the end of my life will be highlighted. So why didn't you run for like the state house or a a state Senate seat or something like that? You know, I had a chance several times. And once again, you know, I always pick the more non-traditional things to do. Mm -hmm. Like people say, why didn't you go for governor? Why didn't you go for Congress or for Senate? Secretary of State for me has a large amount of administrative responsibility. So it is like um, being commissioner in a way where you've got your own staff. You actually, while you have some responsibility to go out there and grip and grin and, and wave and do appearances and give speeches, there's a large administrative role as well. And I actually like that. Mm-hmm. What, do you, what do you think about all this election security stuff? Is that you being asked, are you a, being asked about that? Sure. I think that that cybersecurity is our number one priority. I think in any government agency, even Should where be. I was, when we were handling sensitive healthcare information for veterans, you always have to be on your guard about being able to provide the highest security for the information that you've got. Now, you and I both know there's no system in the world that's 100% unhackable. So the best you can do is provide a good defense, which means every day you need to be concerned. Now, Secretary of State and Deputy Secretary have Homeland Security access, and that's thanks to the National Association of Secretary of State. So they're getting real-time cybersecurity threat information. So that behooves um, the state to maintain that status so that we know what we need to keep working on. Mm-hmm. So being proactive in government is really something that is rarely done. But mm-hmm. when it comes to cybersecurity, oh, you know, you can't just be reactive. Do in you, that. do you, are, are you being asked, are you, well, I already kind of asked you, but are you worried about the integrity of the elections? Is that, is that something that is a big issue in Kentucky? Well, I think every state is worried about the integrity of elections. You hear, you know, about the infiltration of hacking Some in Florida. and so, Well, but you know, I think what I do think is interesting in this day and age is you never know who to believe, right? So uh, one side says true, you've got yeah. issues here and the other side you've got issues here. What I am known for in state government, which I pride myself on, is being a nonpartisan person. And when I go into an office, I want to make my own assessment of what the real needs are. And I do think that people, they look at my history, they look at me and they say, you know, if she's reviewing it and these are her findings, this is the truth. I mean, I'm not there mm-hmm. for one party over the other. I want the system to be the, the most secure. I want people to understand that when they go into the polls and they cast their vote, that nothing is going to happen to that uh, vote, that it's going to be safe and secure. It's going to count as they wanted it to count. And hopefully me as Secretary of State, working with all the county clerks, working with the State Board of Elections, we can make that happen. I'm not here to be a party girl for one side or the other or to fee. I, don't, I hate fear-mongering in the mm-hmm. news. You know, yeah. if we've got issue with the voter rolls, then you know what? Let's deal with those issues. What about the issues of the current Secretary of State who's in the same party as you? She's had some, I guess the Courier Journal brought up some issues about voter rolls and accessing some of yeah, that stuff. Yeah, there, there have been, you know, again, every side has their story, right? There's always okay. three sides to the truth. Yours, <laughs> mine, and somewhere in the middle is the truth, right? Right, right? So as I have tried to gather some information, but not have to really solely focus on it because I'm not her, mm-hmm. um, you know, Whatever has transpired in her office, I do know that there are people who make phone calls to Secretary of State's office. They ask to find access or who, what party affiliation. But you know what? You actually can go online on the right. Secretary of State's website, and with the right information, you as a citizen can do that. Yep. So if I were Secretary of State... I wouldn't be taking those phone calls. I'd be like, you know what? If you want to find out what party affiliation someone is, then you go get their birth date. You get their full name. Here's the website link. You go do it because that's not our job. And if someone can't do that for themselves, then they're going to fill out a sheet so that you know who called for you to access. And that information is not, doesn't have vital information, only has in there mm-hmm. if they're active registered status and has their registration, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or independent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I talked to one of the sheriffs here that, mm-hmm. that knows, I won't say who it is, but um, he, I said, I was going to interview you, and he said, oh, they're kind of giving her a hard time with this election. And I said, who? He said, oh, the Republicans. I said, well, what do they, what do they have? They said, well, basically, it's the letter behind her name. And I said, look, as a former political reporter, when they say that, that means they got nothing. Right. If all they can attack you is your party. Yeah. And that's really, truly what, and he said, that's, that's all they got. 
And I, I go back, I revert to it, and what I said to him was, I bet you it's just people like her because you're a very likable person. So, and I, I don't feel like I'm sucking up to you or something like no. that. I don't mean to be at all. I just, you know, I, you know, I, I know you outside of the journalism. I know you better than, say, some sources and some interviews sure. that I've done. But, um, but that just seems to be the, be the you case. You know, I think that experience also um, has a lot to do with – with the job capabilities um, that you can put forth in the future. And I do feel like that, you know, because of the letter behind my name or even because of Miss America and because I'm a female, that people discount sometimes the experience that I've had because I feel like that if I were sitting here as anyone but Heather French Henry Mm -hmm. that has been a former Miss America, that was married to a former lieutenant governor, that was a Democrat, I think you'd look at my resume and go, holy cow. I mean, she led a very statewide department that was really large. She has Mm -hmm. great experience to take on. But because of all of those things together, you know, it gives people, well, you know, what can she do? What does she know? And, you know, because she's a Democrat, she's going to advocate for, you know, these crazy things. You know, in the end... Mm -hmm. I led a nonpartisan department, and that's exactly the way Secretary of State's office should be run. Should be. It's a ministerial Absolutely department. It's not a discretionary department. People don't understand that. Absolutely. It's there to serve the people. It's not there it's to serve the It's become partisan, party. which drives me nuts. As, as a former right. political reporter who really believes in the, the beauty of the system, of the democracy, the, you know, this republic mm-hmm. de- democracy that we have here in this country, the Secretary of State's of anybody should be just left out of it. That's exactly. And when I filed, I told the news media, they asked what I was uh, filing as. And I said, you know, I'm filing as a Democrat. Now, mind you, I'm a conservative Democrat, a Wendell Ford Democrat, I should say. Okay. But I... Famous Kentucky politics. Governor, right? right? Yes. A governor and senator. Oh, and senator, correct. Yes. But as I said, I said, but I fully intend on running the Secretary of State's office in a nonpartisan manner. Mm -hmm. That's it. I guess the proof will be in the pudding if you win. And if the primary is in any indication... Well, we're going to work hard. You know, you can never take things for granted. We did show very well in the primary. I was ecstatic. I was shocked. Who knew Mm -hmm. that uh, I would get that kind of support? But hopefully it's a testament to how I've led my life, certainly. But, you know, the one negative thing about, well, there's many negative things about running a campaign in politics, is that, unfortunately, running a campaign really doesn't, is not as applicable to how you can run the office, right? So anyone can run a political race, right? Um, The one thing that should show people what kind of boss you will be is the manner with which you run the campaign. And in this particular race, it is very evident um, how um, each of us will lead. Meaning your opponent. Well, opponent and even other candidates and other races as well. I think you can tell a lot about people and what type of boss they will be, what type of team player they are by the manners with which they're running their campaigns and the way that they say things. And when they give their speeches, you know, are you talking about the other side or are you talking about what you want to do? Talk about what you want to do. Run your race. You know, that's really what we should be focused on. Right. It would be nice if we could tone it down a little bit. Sure. Yeah. The divisiveness has gotten out of hand. I agree, one hundred percent. Was there anything I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? I other think you got to get going. You're, other, you're yeah, on a campaign trail, right? I, I am. I am certainly. But um, other than the fact that um, you know, I came back to Kentucky after Miss America, not only to get married and raise a family, but because, as Rosemary said, you never forget where you came from. You know, and from yep. one sort of northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati, well, no, like northeastern. Cincinnati chili? Oh, I do. Skyline. Okay. Okay, yeah, there we go. We're, we're but on I the will same say, page. Gold Star Chili um, was one of my sponsors for one of my ads for Miss Kentucky. And that's a great, oh, you yeah. know, Cincinnati. I had some Gold Star recently. They are a good. I actually. Yeah. Wrote a story about them on their 75th anniversary, and um, really got to know some of the Dowd family. They're wonderful yeah, people, absolutely, They're really good folks. Um, I do have to say, in a, in a pinch, though, I do like Skyline a little bit better. Well, but I, love I them won't both. turn it. I won't turn anything. But let's any just go to down. ice cream, like Grater's ice oh, cream. Oh yeah, Grater's. Oh, raspberry chocolate chip. Mm. Yeah, doesn't I, get any better than that. My, my daughter calls it the purple ice cream place. Yeah, that's what she calls it because she loves great stuff. The purple ice cream place. That's great that's stuff. Her stuff. Well, Heather, so glad we could make this happen. Thank, Thank you very you. much for doing this. It's well, wonderful to see it. you again. Great to see you too. Times at the news record. Times all at the news the memories. record. Oh, yeah. All our news record people will be writing in and saying. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, good to see you again. Good luck on the campaign trail. Stay safe out there. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again like another 10 years or maybe sooner. Who knows? Hopefully you know, sooner. Hopefully sooner. Great. All right. Thanks, Take Heather. Care. Yeah, Bye. You too. Bye.
Uh, what a great conversation with Heather. Thanks again to Heather for being on the show. She uh, took some time out of her busy schedule during the campaign uh, in uh, in the fall there to talk with me. She was uh, just great as she always has been in the many years I've known her. So thanks, Heather, and I'm glad to finally get this out there. Tune in again next week for another great show. Thanks for listening to From Cincinnati. Be sure to check out our website at FromCincinnati.com. Thanks again for listening. See you next time. You've been listening to From Cincinnati. We're online at FromCincinnati.com or at From Cincinnati on Twitter. Search for our page on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and other social media. Send in your guest ideas. We'd love to hear who you want to hear on the show. You can also email us through our website or call 513-549-NEWS or send us a message on social media. Please rate and subscribe to our show in Apple Podcasts. Your ratings and reviews Reviews really do help others find the show. If Apple Podcasts isn't your thing, you can find us on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, or we have been told if you hook up the internet to your old Crossley radio, you can find From Cincinnati there. You can even ask your smart speaker to play From Cincinnati. I'm Joanne Lichtenstein, not from Cincinnati, but my sister used to live there. I'm in beautiful Burbank, California, and the voice of From Cincinnati. You can find me and my voiceover services at Joanne. Voices.com. From Cincinnati is a production of High Priority Partners, LLC, and is distributed through Loveland Local News. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next Monday and every Monday for a new chat with someone new because everybody has a story, but not everyone is from Cincinnati.